Thank you for 10,000 subscribers. To celebrate, I'm making a bunch of cool resources available to you. I have several modules I use on a consistent basis that hold a bunch of useful utility libraries and classes. Some of the resources are from other developers, some are modified by me, and some are made by me. They're just kind of all bundled together. I'm also making an announcement that I'll be opening my YouTube memberships soon if they're not up already. These memberships will be tied into my Discord server, so members get access to some extra exclusive channels and resources. So the resources that are in this place is in a set of four modules, and these are split up into their different categories. So function utils, as the name implies, houses a bunch of categorized utility functions. Module utils houses mainly classes that can be used by the client or the server, and then client module utils is explicitly for the client. I'll give some brief examples of some of the code in here and how you can use it in your games. And if you want to grab the code, there's going to be a copy or a link of this uncopy lock game down in the description. The only setup you're going to need is to make sure that these four modules are located within the same container somewhere, ideally probably replicated storage, and that module utils needs to be required by a server script. And other than that, you should be good to go. So on a quick play test, what you're going to notice is this thing on the bottom right of my screen, which is a spinning forklift. And you might think, hey, wait a second, is that a viewport frame? No, it isn't. It's actually an image label that has a flipbook being emulated on it, which should be a standard default Roblox feature with image labels, but they aren't. So I made a specific class for this, the GUI image class, and this is basically just it serves as a wrapper class over image labels. And there's a method in here to create a flipbook on your image label, and you can give it some parameters like what the image ID is, what the resolution is, what the flipbook layout mode is, what the flipbook mode is, stuff like that, frame rate, repeat count, direction, reset, that kind of fun stuff. And that allows you to place flipbooks inside of image labels. So as an example, I have a, a spinning forklift which is pretty funny. Some other neat features of stuff inside of these modules is for example, being able to calculate where exactly a billboard GUI is located. So with this billboard GUI here on this part, let me see if I can select it, if Roblox will work. So I have a billboard GUI inside of here and then I have a bunch of the properties set for like extents offset world space, studs offset, we got stud offset world space, and sometimes there might be a situation where you want to know exactly where this is rendered. I specifically use this for my wrapper class for billboard GUIs. So as you can see, when I rotate my camera around, this point is being rendered exactly where the billboard GUI is. And even if I were to select this part and I were to rotate it around, you're going to see that it perfectly shows us where exactly the billboard GUI is being rendered, which is pretty cool. The math behind this is kind of a lot, so actually let's hop into the script. The math in here is pretty simple because I just have a function inside of the math section of my function utils called get billboard world position. And you just give it a billboard and it returns a vector three. So if we go into this function, this does a whole bunch of fun calculations to calculate where exactly the billboard should be rendered in the world. And then it returns that to you as a vector three. In fact, this math section of the function utils has a whole bunch of different fun functions in here. For example, if you ever wanted to get the axis align bounding box of something, or specifically, there's a very specific one in here for the camera. Let me see if I can find it. It should be get camera align bounding box. Here we go. This allows you to grab a camera align bounding box, which is what the function for getting the position of a billboard uses, because one of the properties of a billboard UI, I believe, is going to be it's probably going to be extents offset. Let's see, let's read the description. Determines how the billboard GUI is offset from its adorney relative to the camera orientation and units half the dimensions of the model's camera aligned bounding box. So because of how this property works, we need this very specific function to get a camera aligned bounding box and it does a whole bunch of bounding box calculations and it's oriented or aligned with the camera you provide or it defaults to the workspace.current camera. So that's pretty cool. There's uh, some other useful libraries inside of function utils. For example, one specifically for the camera and there's some neat ones in here. So for example, you can get the camera line bounding box. So you got to use that math function. You give the size that that function generates to this one. And then based on the camera's field of view and aspect ratio, it returns a number to 
give you basically how far away you need to move a camera in studs to encapsulate this entire size within the camera's field of view. That sounds a little complex, but I'm gonna show you an example because I have one in this game. So if I go and walk on this part right here, you're gonna see that my camera moves to this part. I'm using springs, by the way. That's also somewhere inside of here. I believe it's a module utils. There should be, yeah, there's a spring module in there. So I'm using a spring and with this part, currently I'm calculating what the camera align bounding box is with a little bit of padding. So if we go in the script here, what I am doing is when the player enters this zone, I'm calculating the camera line bounding box of this part right here. Get the C frame, get the size, and then I also get the field of view and the aspect ratio of the camera. And then I calculate the distance that the camera needs to be away from this part using fit camera align bounding box to camera. So it gives us that distance. And then of course we add a little bit of padding based on the field of view of the camera. And then this, uh, mouse offset rotation just allows me to have this kind of cool effect. You might have seen this in the Paths of Peril devlogs. But basically, you throw all that into a C frame, or before we throw it into a C frame, we throw it into a positional and rotational spring. We set the targets of those so that way it kind of looks all smooth, nice, and fancy when we're looking at this part. But if I were to go to reset this part, so let's say I shrink down size like that, you can see our camera's moving to try and fit this part within the camera's field of view. So the more I shrink this, you can see the camera zooming in. And then if I were to increase the size like this, you're going to see that the camera perfectly backs away at the correct distance to make sure that this uh, part's camera line bounding box fits within the field of view or the rendering of the viewport. And even if I were to rotate it, you're going to see that it's going to back the camera away to make sure it actually fits. So as you can see now that the part is vertical, my camera moved back even further to make sure it fit this part inside of the camera's viewport, which is pretty neat. If you see here, I've got a spinning monkey. Pretty cool, pretty funny. How is this monkey spinning? Well, if we take a look at the script inside of here, you can see that I'm using a class inside of module utils called random rotator. This is a pretty simple class. It just has a constructor for constructing a new random rotator. There's some parameters for it, so you can kind of mess around with how you want it to rotate, what the random number generator, random number generator is, excuse my English. And all you need to do is call this function to update it every single frame. So that's all we're doing. We call update on the rotator, we get that orientation, and then we just construct it on the monkey based on its current position with this new orientation. And now we have a funny spinning, randomly spinning monkey. Inside of client module utils, I have a cinematic class that allows you to create cinematics with Bezier curves. So guess what? You see these parts? That's me creating a sequence of positions I want my camera to interpolate to, and it kind of creates a Bezier curve between all these points. So when we go and step on this pad, we should have a cinematic happen for the camera. So let's go step on here, and then here we go. We've got our cinematic, the camera's moving, it's rotating around, and then eventually it'll get to the ending camera position, which is over there, and there you go. There was your cinematic. So that's pretty cool too. You wanna make easy peasy cinematics? We got a cinematic class for it. All you gotta do is you gotta give it a model, and this model or folder needs to have a bunch of parts in it, named from one to however many parts you want, and then it's going to construct a busier curve, and then all you need to do is call this start function to start the cinematic. And then you also need to bind it to render step so that way you can actually update the camera. Let's actually go ahead and take a look for the code in this cinematic model. I have a script right here and we get our client module utils. And every time our touch part is touched, we construct a new cinematic object by giving it the cinematic folder that has each of our parts named one through six. We bind to render step and all this is going to do is set the current camera's C frame to the C frame provided to this function. This function will also get passed uh, when the cinematic is done and there's an event for it too, which we're waiting for down here. So we start the cinematic, we give it the duration. We can optionally define the easing style and the easing direction. And I have a whole bunch of easing styles and easing directions defined within the math section. So there's going to be an easing style, easing direction section. You can see you have your different uh, in, out, out, in, that kind of stuff. And then easing style, you have your different easing styles like linear, quad, sine, back, exponential. You just pass these functions to the cinematic class and then it knows exactly what to do. And then the cinematic's running and all we need to do is wait for the cinematic to end. When it's over, we just destroy it. 
set the camera back to custom, and that's it. Very simple script, and you've got easy peasy cinematics you can throw into your game. Another example of something useful I wanna showcase is going to be proxies. So in function utils, there's a specific class or a library, whatever you wanna call it, called proxy. And basically what this allows you to do is, there should be a constructor in here. Let's go to the create constructor. You give it a table, and what it does is it returns a proxy of the table and a signal, and this signal fires any time values inside of this table changes. And then this even includes descendant tables, it goes through, it's a deep operation, so it goes through all the tables in the table, and it will fire the signal and give you basically an array of all the keys and then what value has changed somewhere inside of the table, which is pretty cool. So as an example, I create a new proxy with this empty table. I have my table, path to the create function, which is what gives me my proxy and a signal. Now right here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna connect to the signal and we're going to listen to what keys get changed and what the new value is. And then we reference the proxy here and we just start updating a bunch of keys and values inside of here. So I make a key, some key, set it to a value of 10, which should fire the signal. And then I do the same thing with a table, put a table here, banana is true. Same thing with some table. And then I put a new key in there, set that to 50. So we should see all of these reflected within this print statement. And to prove that we can just run the game. You might've seen these in the output earlier. So here's the first print and we get an array right here. The key was some key and it got added a value of 10. Oh, seems like that matches. How about the next one? We get an array of some table, okay, and it gets given a value of another table that has bananas equals true in it. That worked as well. And then we had another update here for the key some table, and then inside of some table we had another key update of some new key, and that got set to a value of 50. Epic! A very simple proxy class that you can use for Hmm, I don't know, maybe replicating data changes within some kind of server-sided data thing to a client. That could be a use case for it. That's what I use it for, but there's tons of endless possibilities with it and combine it with any of the other stuff in here, make whatever you want. I mean, there's a lot of resources inside of here. I've, I've, I've barely scratched the surface of what's in here. Like I included Sira. This is a great module for serializing buffers. You might've seen it in my buffer video. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. It's a great video. We also have T, the runtime type checker. I use this all the time as well. We have a bunch of utility functions for tables. A lot of these is made by Slightnik, the absolute goat of Roblox development. And then I also added a bunch of other table functions in here that I needed, if I can find any. Random, uh, I added a function for making weak caches because that's pretty useful sometimes because I don't like typing out set meta table, meta table, blah, 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 blah. All the meta tables are stored in here. So if you want any weak caches, all you need to do is just reference one of these meta tables in here. So that way it kind of saves on memory. I mean, it's not a lot of memory usage, but it's savings nonetheless. We have other sections in here for observers. So not only are the Slightnik observers in here, I have a bunch of other observers that I've made that I've put in here. Like, what's an example of one that Slightly doesn't have? I think observe local character. Added this one in here for just observing the local character. You call this on the client side. We have some other ones such as observing descendants, children, observing ancestry. I don't know if Slightly has one of these. I don't think so. I'm pretty sure, yeah, I made this one. And then observing all attributes on something as well because there is only an observe attribute. And sometimes you want to observe all the attributes on something without needing to know what the attribute name is. So this one's pretty useful as well. Client module utils also includes a bunch of other wrapper classes for like GUI buttons, objects, strokes, text class that just adds some extra features. There's some third party stuff in here like easy visuals, as well as this lightning effects module that I found that I heavily improved the performance on. It's good enough performance. I'm just kind of limited by the fact that Roblox does not give us any kind of bulk set method in the workspace to update any type of property. We only have bulk move to, so the performance on this module is kind of capped, but it creates some cool lightning effects. We also have streamable, again, from Slightnik. There's a lot of Slightnik stuff in here because he makes some great stuff, like uh, there should be Trove in here. Yeah, Trove. I use this all the time, guys. Trove. Use it. It's amazing. We also have Slightnik's typed bindables and typed remotes in here because typing your bindables and your remotes is also very neat. 
we have a zone module that I found on the dev forum. This one's pretty good. It's like a more up-to-date version than uh, HD's like zone plus module or whatever. So this is a zone module I use and that I have included in here. And I have some other classes that are made by me like adjustment pool. This one's pretty uh, useful. I use this for, I believe this is being used within POP specifically for like how item effects stack on different stats. So this allows you to basically just pool together a bunch of different modifiers, multipliers, offsets, whatever, without you needing to keep track of it all over the place. You just create one adjustment pool and then you can evaluate the total of the adjustment pool. So that way, like if you remove a multiplier to like, for example, character's walk speed, it doesn't screw everything up and you don't have to like keep track of like, oh, what was the original walk speed or whatever? No, it's all kept track by this class. And there's some useful things in it, like uh, there's an a public observe method, so you can observe when values change and stuff like that. What else we got in here? There's simple cache type class. There's this data catalog. I specifically use this data catalog for front end information that needs to be stored in like UIs and stuff like that. So that's what this one's pretty good at for using. And I mean, I could keep talking about all the stuff in here. There's just a lot of stuff. I can't go over all of it. Otherwise, this video would be too long. So if you would like to check out the code and use it in your projects, the link to this uncopy lock place will be in the description. So go download it, use the code, use it for whatever you want. I don't really care. Have fun with it, experiment around and see what you can make with some of this stuff. Otherwise, thank you for watching. Thank you for 10,000 subscribers and I will see you next time.